That feels like the perfect evolution to the Super Mario 3D World format. Perhaps Bowser's Fury was made as a test. It's easy to see how this odd side story could be Nintendo toying with new ideas. It almost feels like a proof of concept test to do to Mario what Breath of the Wild did to Zelda. To a blueprint for the future of 3D Mario. Proof of concept idea for like the future of 3D Mario. This is very concept. much the future of the, of the Mario of franchise. And what it may mean for the future of Mario. It's probably just a glimpse at what the future will bring for 3D Mario games. It could be a tease what's in store for Mario's future. But could be the future of 3D Mario games. I really hope Nintendo uses this game as a blueprint for future Mario franchises. Clearly, they're planting the seeds for something in the future, right? As a blueprint for future Nintendo experiences. Nintendo may be giving us a glimpse into the future of Mario here. Since its release, general consensus seems to be that, whenever and whatever the next 3D Mario game is, Bowser's Fury almost definitely provides the blueprint for that game. There's a certain kind of sense to this. Super Mario Odyssey came out in 2017, four years before Bowser's Fury. It seemed inevitable at the time that a new 3D Mario game was going to come out relatively soon. And since Bowser's Fury was a bite-sized expansion, how could it not provide a taste of what's to come? Of course, there are a number of problems with this shared assumption. For one, what the heck does it mean for Bowser's Fury to be the future of 3D Mario? And also, since the question of what seems to be a certainty in this case, it's surprising the more important question never seems to be asked. Should Bowser's Fury be the future of 3D Mario? So, considering it's 2024, and we're quickly approaching 8 years since the last full 3D Mario experience, the longest period between 3D Mario games ever, I thought it was high time this discussion was reopened, and maybe we can discern what exactly it is about Bowser's Fury that has people so entranced. Bowser's Fury is an easily likable game. From just the opening moments, the game brims with personality. Mario is clearly over the whole thing before it even begins, consistently characterized with shrugs and tiresome glances. Lake Lapcat is a wonderful zone, teal blue skies and clear water expanding in every direction. The area, as the name suggests, is cat-themed to a comical degree. Pretty much everything, from the enemies to the geography, has been covered in a coat of fur and slapped on a tail. The names of the levels are often titled after cat-related activities activities and puns. The cheerful energy of Lake Lapcat also serves to juxtapose the titular Bowser's Fury more effectively. Opposite the sandy white shores, the black goop at the center of the lake slowly billows over time until it explodes, blanketing the entire area in a torrential storm in mere seconds. It's an effective transition. The game also does a good job juxtaposing the size of the land. While most of the game sees you jumping against the typical assortment of platforms, the Fury Bowser fights represent Lake Lapcat in miniature, having you hop over the levels as you conduct the battle. Afterwards, Bowser Jr. congratulates you for beating up his dad, tempering his enthusiasm with the fact that his dad is supposed to be too awesome to be beaten. These aspects of Bowser's fury are instantly endearing, and it's no wonder considering this why so many seem certain of the game's continued legacy in the series' development. Having said that, the question of should Bowser's Fury represent the future of 3D Mario is difficult to answer, because I'm not quite sure what Bowser's Fury is bringing to the table that's much different from a typical 3D Mario. 3D Mario games tend to have a similar structure. In its most general form, the games usually boil down to unlocking a series of hubs, each with their own collection of levels, which you're free to do in any order until you reach the star requirement to progress to the next hub of levels. The similarities between games became even more evident when comparing Galaxy 2's and Odyssey's post-games to one another, which are almost identical. A special world filled with mostly remixed levels, give or take a Mushroom Kingdom, new collectibles that appear in older levels as an excuse to go back and re-explore, followed by one final post-game challenge. Bowser's Fury largely adheres to the established formula, with each of the Gigabells acting as a hub for a series of levels. In that sense, they feel most similar to the domes from Galaxy 1. Yet despite this similarity, the game Bowser's Fury feels most like is Mario 64, and not in a particularly good way. Many of the levels in Bowser's Fury are designed as linear, often vertical towers, where the challenge is to climb to the summit. However, because these levels contain multiple shines, it often means repeating many sections of platforming that you've already done, just to get back to the actually relevant portion of the level. 
This is an irritating commonality featured in many of Mario 64's levels, like Womp's Fortress, Cool Cool Mountain, Tall Tall Mountain, Tiny Huge Island, Tick Tock Clock, and Rainbow Ride. And while the levels don't take long to traverse, the problem is even more noticeable in Bowser's Fury, exacerbated by the lack of variety in mission objectives. You can expect pretty much the same things in each of the levels, like collecting blue coins or collecting five cat shines, or defeating a Shadow Mario figure. The bottom line is that a good portion of the levels in Bowser's Fury really don't feel designed to have multiple objectives within them, leading to some awkward shines where the game gives you a propeller to fly through the level, only to make you backtrack through the entire thing again with a key in tow. However, the criticism of linear levels being treated more like sandboxes was ultimately filtered through another enduring criticism of 3D Mario, the boot-out system. Every time you collect a star or shine in a level, you're kicked out to the central hub of the game and forced to re-enter to begin the next objective. While this makes sense in certain context-specific missions, the logic was that if we could simply continue playing the levels, we would be able to collect more stars in one go, mitigating some of the more annoying backtracking. This problem reached its tedious apex in Galaxy 2's Green Stars, where it often felt like it took almost as long to collect the Green Stars as it did to exit and re-enter a stage. As it turns out, Bowser's Fury does indeed have an answer to the boot-out system, and it's… truly bizarre. In Bowser's Fury, once you complete an objective, in order to start the next one in that stage, you have to physically boot yourself out of the stage and then re-enter. But it's not enough to just go to any patch of ocean outside the zone. In order to load up the next shine, you need to travel to another named area entirely, which usually ends up being the hub next to the level. In other words, Bowser's Fury, for the first time in series history, changed the boot-out system from automatic to manual. This is an extremely strange choice, one that somehow feels even more archaic than Mario 64, a game which came out 23 years ago from the release of Bowser's Fury. And while there are several cases where stages will change fairly dramatically between objectives, this new and impaired bootout system simply leads further credence to the idea that these levels were really not considered with multiple shines in mind. Surely there's a better way to do this. To be fair, this problem is alleviated in the post-game, where simply fast traveling to the entrance of the level will reset it, but I mean, still. Unfortunately, it's not the only irritation in Bowser's Fury. Probably the most well-documented criticism of the game is Bowser himself. Every few minutes or so, Bowser will pop out of the ocean and begin a rampage. To stop this, you need to collect any shine to force him back into the water, at least until you have enough shines to fight him directly. Additionally, there are also Fury Blocks, which can only be destroyed by Bowser in this state and generally lead to a shine. None of what I've just said is a problem. What is a problem is how many Fury Blocks there are. Every stage has a set, on top of some that exist in the hub areas. Moreover, in the postgame, an island with five cat shines appears whenever Bowser is activated, giving yet another reason why you'd want him active. Remember though, you can only collect one shine before Bowser goes back into the ocean. Bowser's Fury is not a long game. On my most recent playthrough, it took a little over 4 hours to 100%. Bowser only comes out so many times during the time it takes to beat the game. As a consequence, what should be a fun interruption too easily feels like a chore, where I need to wait for Bowser to awaken and plan what I'm going to do with him for the next few awakenings. And if I don't plan properly, it simply means wasted time, and more cycles of Bowser that I have to sit through. This doesn't feel in the spirit of what Fury Bowser ought to be. He should be a thing of fear, not a predictable nuisance on my carefully laid out timetable. Hopefully, after saying all of this, my confusion is a little more clear. When people talk about Bowser's Fury being the future of 3D Mario, what are people actually talking about? Bowser's Fury isn't really doing anything different. As I've shown, the game bears a striking resemblance in both form and structure to its predecessors, and it plays out in very similar ways, too. If anything, Galaxy offered players more freedom than Bowser's Fury ever did. Due to the way progression was handled in Galaxy, it's entirely possible to just skip entire swaths of galaxies on your way to the 60 stars needed to reach Bowser. And that's not really mentioning the fact that both the engine room and garden are framed within the game as optional. You only need to collect the first four grand stars. And while, of course, Super Mario Galaxy is a much more expansive game than Bowser's Fury, the freedom offered by Galaxy demonstrates at least that Bowser's Fury is not offering an unparalleled or unprecedented sense of freedom here. 
In other ways, like with the aforementioned bootout system, Bowser's Fury provides an even more anachronistic vision of 3D Mario. Taken all together, when I look at the game, the only thing that really stands out to me as being particularly new is that it is the first 3D Mario game where you can travel between the levels seamlessly. And yet this decision has clearly come with some consequences. The bootout system in Bowser's Fury can be traced quite directly from the decision to make Lake Lapcat one large zone. If the goal was to provide a seamless experience, forcibly booting out the player to the entrance of a level after every shine collected would be jarring, completely contrary to the stated goal. It's an intrusion on my decision making. Perhaps I wanted to jump off a high ledge after collecting the shine and move elsewhere, but if the game booted me out itself, such an option would be impossible. I would be starting from ground zero, literally. In this way, the decision to change the bootout system to manual makes a great deal of sense for a game ostensibly offering more freedom. However, on a broader level, the game seems ambivalent in actually making use of Lake Lapcat's seamless nature. Bowser's Fury ensures minimal time is spent outside of any one level, using Plessy to bridge the ocean between levels in a matter of seconds. Bowser's Fury makes clear that the main attraction, as it's always been, are the individual levels that populate the world. This is a sensible decision. Would taking slightly longer to reach the next level really enhance the game in any way? Unlikely. In the end, Bowser's Fury's big step forward doesn't amount to much in the grand scheme of things. But I'm burying the lead here. When people say they want Bowser's Fury to represent the future of 3D Mario, what they're talking about isn't what Bowser's Fury actually is in practice, but what its seamlessness suggests. The first truly open world Mario game. And that is where I have the biggest objection. Honestly, the idea alone is deeply unexciting. The next step in a major series being an open world game is hardly a novel or innovative concept at this point, and what has become increasingly clear is that these kinds of games come with a lot of drawbacks. But I think an open world Mario game might suffer uniquely, in ways specific to the Mario franchise. On the surface, open world games are appealing because they promise, well, the world. However, to achieve this effect, it usually ends up requiring a lot of reuse to populate the entire game space with things to do. As such, the criticism a lot of these open world games face is that they become less interesting the more you explore them. What at first seemed to be an exciting journey of unparalleled scope transforms into a monotonous grind of now mundane tasks over the course of several dozens of hours. It would be wrong to call this laziness. Even games with an inordinate amount of effort put into them, like Tears of the Kingdom or Elden Ring, fail to escape the gravity well of fatigue. It seems much more likely that this reuse is simply an endemic part of what it means to be an open world game. At this current point in time, it is simply not possible to construct worlds of this caliber that are filled with totally unique and bespoke events around every corner. Acknowledging this point then, is this really enough to caution against an open world Mario game? Personally, I think it is, but I also think there's a more specific reason within the context of it being a Mario game that makes the idea fairly unappetizing. Mario has already gone through this open world fatigue criticism, despite not even having an open world game yet. Super Mario Odyssey prefigures the modern open world in many ways. Many of its kingdoms are far vaster than any levels seen in a Mario game previously, and even the smaller ones offer a level of choice in how to go about collecting its moons that similarly characterizes the focus on player freedom by many open worlds. Yet in offering this freedom, what ended up being Odyssey's main sticking point? Too many moons. Just way too many moons. Look, I understand why the statement this game has too much content might not make any sense. How can a game possibly have too much content anyway? Especially when most of it is optional. Every kingdom in Super Mario Odyssey is like the Mushroom Kingdom, an overwhelming amount of shitty filler moons and only a rare few that are worth your time. Structurally, the game is telling you that no matter how much fun you're having, if you grab a single moon after the minimum, you are objectively wasting your time. And when it throws moons at you like this, it's difficult to disagree. Dozens upon dozens upon dozens of filler moons that seem to add little apparent value to the game, and indeed, as many have argued, might actually subtract value. It's worth pointing out that this is a valid critique. 
I seem to like Odyssey more than the average online video essayist, but I would agree that ground-pounding random spots for moons or herding sheep is hardly compelling. There are literally hundreds of moons in the game. It probably wouldn't hurt if the game had a few less. With this in mind, it's difficult to imagine an open-world Mario game resolving this issue. On the contrary, based on the evidence, it will almost certainly make the problem worse, a game stuffed with even more less interesting stuff to dilute the space between all the more interesting stuff. And that isn't great. The effect seems clear to me. Mario games have always had reuse. As I pointed out in my Galaxy videos, nearly a quarter or more of the game's main stars are comets, remixes of levels you've already played. And that's not counting all the reuse that permeates both games just doing the regular levels. This, however, hasn't stopped me from 100%ing the Galaxy games dozens of times collectively over the years. On the other hand, I've only fully completed Odyssey twice. It's just hard to justify doing something that long, and in some instances, too boring. This aligns Odyssey with other open world games that I have no desire to replay. I'm certainly in no rush to complete all the shrines in Tears or Catacombs in Elden Ring, and to be honest, I don't think I ever will. This hints at a more fundamental problem with making an open world Mario. The reason why it's never not fun to recomplete a Galaxy game despite the rampant repetition is because it's incredibly fast paced. Moving from mechanic to mechanic so quickly you barely have time to breathe. In fact, if you could pinpoint one defining aspect of the Mario series as a whole, this frenetic energy is likely to be your best bet. And ironically, what better game could demonstrate this idea than the game Bowser's Fury came packaged with, Super Mario 3D World? 3D World remains a massively underrated title in the Mario franchise, in that it might just be the best game in the series, though it's never recognized as such. It's crazy just how much stuff is in this game, from the sheer number of levels, to the little nooks and crannies in the overworld, to the mystery boxes and Captain Toad stages, to the themes of the levels themselves. I mean, this game just does not stop. And why should it? It would be worse off if it did. But this hardly applies to just 3D World. Last year, Super Mario Wonder was showered in accolades for exactly this kind of energy. Even the more maligned titles on the margins of the franchise seem to understand this. Color Splash's biggest strength is by far the variety of locales offered by its level-based structure, providing snappy, bite-sized stories that, in the game's best moments, contribute to some larger picture. All of which should serve to show why an open-world Mario game is a strange choice. By nature, open world games tend to be slower and more contemplative, and while this works to the benefits of games like Tears of the Kingdom, I hesitate to say that such Mario games would benefit in the same way. Indeed, we've already seen how Mario games chafe when being threatened to slow down. In Odyssey, the Jaxies were positioned around the game's largest kingdom, Toasterina, to dramatically reduce the time it takes to get anywhere. Not that the kingdom was really that big to begin with, in the grand scheme of things. Plessy serves the same function in Bowser's Fury. It's very clear that Mario games are self-conscious about players standing still for too long, and that's to their benefit. Why waste time walking between all of the interesting set pieces when you could just do them right now? I'm not trying to say that an open world Mario game is impossible, or that it couldn't be done well, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't pessimistic about the prospect. My favorite part of Bowser's Fury comes right before beating the final boss. It's a moment completely unlike the rest of the game. Shortly after fighting Bowser again, he cloisters himself underwater, as is typical. But what happens next is anything but. Instead of the happy Lake Lapcat theme resuming, the rain immediately starts up again, and Bowser pops out of the water just as quickly as he's submerged. Suddenly, all of my assumptions were off the table. Why is he here again? Where's the nearest shine? I didn't plan for this. Bowser had thrown my timetable completely out the window. I scurried over to the nearest shine I could find, attempting to get my bearings, but to my dismay, Bowser was still on a rampage. And that's when I realized he wasn't going away anymore. As it turns out, Bowser will continue in this stage until you hit 50 shines, and are able to fight him once again in the game's climactic battle. But that ending rush to get to 50 shines is the one time Bowser's fury feels like something innovative. Instead of a scheduling inconvenience, Bowser is a legitimate obstacle, and that obstacle forced me to consider the interconnectedness of the levels offered in Lake Lapcat. It would be too daunting to try to do an entire proper level under the duress of Bowser's flames, so a better bet would be for me to surf around the area and find any hidden or plessy shines where I could avoid Bowser as much as possible. 
Here, the open nature of Bowser's Fury was utilized as a tool to overcome an obstacle, rather than a mere aesthetic space separating traditional Mario levels. And it does all this while in an energetic manner completely consistent with what we've come to expect from the Mario series. It's great, but it's also the exception that proves the rule. If an open world Mario game is to exist, it's going to have to look radically different from Bowser's Fury to be interesting. And that's because, taken as a whole, Bowser's Fury is not nearly as radical a game as it's hyped up to be. It's a game that isn't quite able to embrace an open world format. If anything, when it goes to such lengths to minimize the time not spent in its linearly designed platforming challenges, it's a game that ultimately spends more time extolling the virtues of the traditional format rather than altering them. Bowser's Fury is a brilliant game in many respects. Despite my emphasis on its shortcomings, things like the manual bootout system and Bowser's scheduling aren't issues that severely hamper the experience. But I suspect they don't hamper the experience because the experience is only four hours long. It was a carefully crafted side package that was only ever supposed to be four hours long. Expand the scope of the game, however, and make it dozens of hours longer and those pesky inconveniences will balloon in size and import as well. Should Bowser's Fury represent the future of 3D Mario? Eh, I don't think so.